Welcome in, everybody, episode 798 of the podcast of Assuming America, the Air Tour Sports Podcast. It is Monday, November 27th, 2023, peep. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody enjoyed an incredible holiday weekend. Apologize for the lack of shows. Basically, I recorded Wednesday, but Torres needed some very good time with family. So, Busy show, fun show. By the way, very busy week. I'm actually traveling to two college hoops games later this week. Duke at Arkansas on Wednesday. UConn at Kansas on Friday. If you have recommendations for Fayetteville, for Kansas City, for Lawrence, please let me know. But today, it's all about football. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, do we have ourselves a busy Aaron Torres pod. We are going to start everything at Texas a and didn't know who the coach was going to be. Wasn't quite sure. We had the Mark Stoop stuff on Saturday. They ultimately end up on Mike Elko. We'll talk about why I think Mike Elko works, why I think the Marks. We'll get into the Mark Stoop stuff. Make no mistake. I'm going to tell you why I think it was actually best for all sides that he ended up staying at Kentucky. From there, we'll actually get to some on the field stuff. Michigan beat Ohio State for the third year in a row. Not sure if you heard. Not sure if you heard. I will have a lot to say about Ryan Day. Uh, Also, the Iron Bowl thriller. We'll talk about the college football playoff picture going into championship week. So we just got a jam-packed show. As I said, we will have college hoops later in the week, but there is so much football to react to. One of these shows, I don't know how I'm going to get to all of it. So let's not waste any more time and let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, you don't need me to tell you. You know there is something big happening in the world of college football. When Michigan-Ohio State, boom, gets bumped to the B block, that is right. I want to open with Texas A&M. We've talked about this job multiple times on this show since Jimbo Fisher was fired. And ultimately, after a little bit of a curveball on Saturday night, we got our next head coach at Texas A&M. Mike Elko, the Duke head coach, is hired at Texas A&M. This hours after what was ultimately a fan revolt when we thought it was going to be Mark Stoops. I'm going to talk about the Mark Stoops aspect of things momentarily, but I do want to start with Mike Elko, the head coach. Mike Elko is hired. He comes from Duke, and a couple things stand out. One, first of all, I really like the hire, okay? And first off, the, the, the ultimate thing that stands out, This search ultimately went a lot like I said it would. And I get a lot of stuff wrong. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time. But if you go back and listen to the episode after Jimbo Fisher was hired, I said that I believe that ultimately Texas A&M, we're going to hear about all the big names, whoever they may be. It was obviously ended up being a Lane Kiffin, a Dan Lanning, a Dan Campbell. But I said they're probably going to end up with a guy like Mike Elko. Former defensive coordinator at Texas A&M, knows the program, knows the players on this roster. And ultimately, let's be honest, a guy that's probably going to say yes because of the situation he's in at Duke. So I thought this was going to happen. Now that it has happened, let me just be blunt. I love the hire for so many different reasons. First reason, who he is, what he's about, okay? It's not a splashy hire. And I think if you're not super embedded in the Texas A&M or college football communities, you might sit there and say, Mike Elko, Duke coach, seven and five season. I don't really know. That doesn't really feel all that exciting to me. Well, here's the thing. Do you remember the last hire at Texas A&M? That guy, Jimbo Fisher, that was the sexy name brand. We got to break the bank hire and it didn't work. Jimbo Fisher, I don't want to say he was a disaster because Jimbo Fisher did some really good things, including elevating the talent base that Mike Elko is now inheriting. But Texas A&M tried the super sexy hire. They tried bringing in the national championship winning head coach. They tried overpaying for a guy that was on the back end of his career. And even before that, don't forget that Kevin Sumlin was deemed as a can't miss, no doubt about it, hire after a really good season at Houston the year before. And so they've done the splashy, sexy stuff. Mike Elko isn't that, but that isn't what they need. They need to use the cliche, pardon my take term. They need a, they need a football guy through and through that knows the school, knows the program, knows how to build and develop talent. And oh, by the way, it doesn't hurt that he has a relationship with a lot of these players. Elko, of course, comes from Duke. I I think most people know, but part of why he was hired prior to being the head coach at Duke the last two years as I almost just knocked over my, my mic. 
Uh, Mike Elko was the head coach or was the defensive coordinator of Texas A&M. Goes to Duke for two years, and I thought he was phenomenal, okay? First year, he goes 9-4 and four at Duke. That is insane. Duke hasn't been that good in forever. This year, he goes 7-5. and five. And some people would sit there and say, oh, he went 7-5, and five, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah. But I think this year, in my opinion, kind of showed why Mike Elko probably ultimately had to get out of Duke. They started 4-0. and They started 5-1. and The only loss to Notre Dame on the final possession of the game. And then Riley Leonard, their star quarterback, gets hurt, and they simply can't sustain the level of success. Start five and one, finish seven and five. I'm not great at math, but that's two and four down the stretch. But it also just shows you how hard it is to build and maintain success at Duke. And so because of it, you think about what this guy can potentially do at Texas A&M. Has proven in a short amount of time that he can be a head coach, that he can handle the responsibilities. But also what I like about him is that he knows Texas A&M. He's a guy that was there. He knows the strengths. He knows the weaknesses of the school, of the program. He knows the power players, the boosters, the administration. That stuff matters. It especially matters, I believe, at this particular moment in time in Texas A&M football history. Why is that? It is because, one, you have a super loaded roster for next year, which we're going to get into in a minute, and also... You are going into a season in 2024 in which the SEC is going to look completely different. Texas is coming. Oklahoma is coming. And that's why I was always thinking that I always thought that Mike Elko was the right. First of all, I wasn't even sold that you should fire Jimbo Fisher, given the circumstances. But once that decision gets made, that was why you had to go get Mike Elko, because the last thing you want to do is completely rebuilt from scratch to have a roster that is good enough to compete for a national championship next year. And I'm not saying they're going to win one, but that roster is top five talent in college football. And you could not bring in somebody that had no idea about the the school, the culture, the, this, the, that, and lose a bunch of players to the portal. And so now Mike Elko comes in, he knows the landscape He knows many of the assistant coaches. This is, I think, an important part. And if you're an A&M fan, you already know this. Not that that entire staff doesn't necessarily need to stay, but there are key guys that probably need to be retained. Elijah Robinson, who was the acting interim head coach, E-Rob, was one of the elite recruiters in high school football, college football, excuse me. He has relationships with all those guys. Those players love him. You saw how hard they played for him. Uh, nearly beat LSU on uh, on Saturday at LSU. You need to retain him. There are other people that you need to retain in that building, but also you can put your own spin on it, bring in your own guys. Most importantly, though, and I just touched on this, and this is where I think Mike Elko specifically makes a lot of sense. He knows all those players. And so when you're talking about a roster that is top five talent in college football, Part of the job of the next head coach was going to be to not only recruit and do this, and it was to re-recruit the roster that was in the building. And with due respect to Mark Stoops or whomever, those guys have no relationships with those guys. And so Mike Elko recruited a lot of guys on this roster. You can go back to when Mike Elko left to take the Duke job, and there was a thought that that 2022 recruiting class, the number one recruiting class of all time, was about to fall apart. Because Mike Elko left it, all those guys had such good relationships with him. And so this was one of the big things that I talked about when Jimbo Fisher got fired. I said, it can't just be about a five-year plan and how are we going to build this into a national championship contender? It has to be about the five-week plan of retaining the roster that you currently have. And that's exactly what Mike Elko, I believe, will do. Now, you're not going to keep everybody. Nobody retains a roster at a hundred percent clip, uh, not even Alabama or Georgia, but can you get most of that talent to come back? Because if you can, you have a team that bluntly is good enough to win the sec next year, or at the very least good enough to make a 12 team college football playoff. Think about the guys on that roster. Think about the talent. If you can keep Connor Wigman healthy, if you can keep Walter Nolan, if you can keep whoever, That is a top five roster in college football. So I don't mean to go on and on, 
But I like this hire. He gets the school. He gets the program. And I give Texas A&M's administration credit. We were crushing them on Saturday night. Didn't love the way the whole Mark Stoops thing went down. But they saved themselves. They didn't get somebody that the fan base wasn't behind. The fan base clearly supports this. And I think Mike Elko is going to work. Now, again, I know. You could probably find in the archives. I think, uh, I don't know. I don't think I was doing this show when Jimbo Fisher was hired, but I'm sure there's an article or a quote somewhere. There are certainly tweets that I said, oh, Jimbo Fisher is going to be the guy. He's going to take AM to the next level. I'm not saying Mike Elko is going to win national championships, but what I am saying is in the new SEC, you needed a guy that was going to come in, retain this roster, and hopefully build and frankly develop it in a way that Jimbo Fisher could. I like this hire for Texas A&M. Credit to them, credit to their fans for their patience, and credit to the administration for getting a guy that the fan base believe. Whew. All right. Now, let's get to the good stuff. Okay, we got to talk to Mark Stoops' angle. And, and you know, listen, Mark Stoops, a couple things. I think everybody knows. I don't know how you couldn't at this point. But Mark Stoops was very close to getting this job. And for people who weren't in front of a computer, it was a holiday weekend. Maybe you were with family. Essentially, this is how it went down. Saturday, well, really Friday night, Billy Lucci, Texag's best Texas A&M insider, said it's down to three guys, Mark Stoops, Kyle Whittingham, and uh, who was the other one? I don't even remember. Mike Elko. And I remember seeing that list and saying, hmm, Mark Stoops, whatever, no big thing. Don't don't think he's the guy that I would go after, but whatever. Um, And then... Saturday morning, Pete Thamel, ESPN, Mark Stoops is emerging as a favorite. And then Kentucky beats Louisville in the rivalry game. And everybody says, uh, everybody says, uh, you, you know, he's asked, Mark Stoops is asked about the Texas A&M job. He says, you know, guys, 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 no comment. I am here to talk about this win. You know me. I don't talk about the outside stuff. And then Saturday, about 10 o'clock, 10 30, 11 at night the rumors started to ramp up that he was going to take the job. Sports Illustrated reported it. 24-7 Sports reported it. He was going to be the guy. And it's crazy because I was on air on Fox Sports Radio on Saturday night, and we were talking about what does he make sense for Texas A&M. And then we went to commercial break, and during commercial break, Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio, reports Mark Stoops is coming back to Kentucky. Uh, Billy Lucci confirmed it. And as they say, the rest is history. So I want to dive in, just share some thoughts really quick. Let me start by saying a couple things. One, Mark Stoops put out a statement. I won't bore you with all the details. But he did the whole thing of, yes, I listened to other job opportunities and blah, 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 and this and that. But Kentucky is my home. I love this school. I love the state. Listen, Kentucky fans, you guys are incredible. I love you. Wish I could be in Lexington for the Miami basketball game this weekend, this week. Don't believe uh, Mark Stoops is going to sell you on. Yeah, I listened to this, but no, 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 no. Mark Stoops was ready to take this job. He was ready to leave. And by the way, it felt like most Kentucky fans said, you know what? If he does leave, we're grateful for everything that he's done. We appreciate him. And he was ready to leave. He was ready to take the job. I don't even necessarily blame him because we just talked about the changing SEC, no divisions, Texas and Oklahoma coming. No cross-division game with Mississippi State every year. No Vanderbilt on the roster every year. This was the time for him to get out, and he was trying to get out. We can pretend that, oh, my goodness, da-da-da-da-da, I just want – no. He wanted to get out, and the Texas A&M fans basically revolted and basically said, we will not accept this guy as our head coach. Yes, it had a lot of vibes to the Greg Schiano stuff from six, seven years ago at Tennessee – Thankfully, it didn't get as weird as that whole situation, but it was clear Texas A&M wasn't going to accept it. So then the Regents had to come in, and and I don't know if there was ever an official offer, but it was done. He was ready to take it. He was ready to leave. He ends up not getting the opportunity because of the fact that Texas A&M fans revolted. And so I want to dive in because ultimately, I do think it all worked out for the best. We could talk about what we felt at the moment at 11 a.m. Uh, that day before the Kentucky beat Louisville. We could talk about what we thought at 11 p.m. when we thought he was taking the job. But I do th- I'll think it worked out for the best. First off, um, you know, just just a couple quick things. One, first of all, let me say, let me even start by saying this: I don't blame AM fans. I, 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 I had no problem with the way Tennessee fans acted six, seven years ago. Thought it got a little weird when they started kind of 
making up facts on Greg Schiano. I didn't think that was appropriate. But I have no problem with Texas A&M fans basically saying, nope, this is not good enough, unacceptable. Because at the end of the day, yes, I know that there's a lot of different ways that that programs are are paid for and there's TV money and there's this and that. But you are still the stewards of the program. And I don't believe that Texas A&M fans should just have to accept that, well, this has to be the guy because the AD says so, because the school president says so. The fans were frustrated. This wasn't going to be a universally liked hire. As a matter of fact, it was universally disliked. So I have no problem with the way Texas A&M fans acted. I will also say this. I think it all worked out for the best for everybody involved. From the Texas A&M, or from the Texas A&M perspective, we already talked about Mike Elko. But from the Mark Stoops perspective, one thing stands out. What do I say on this show all the time? In life, two things can be true. And with Mark Stoops, I know there's been some frustration, but I also know that most Kentucky fans understand he's the best head coach that we've had in our lifetimes. We would have been sad to see him go. And so while I think that he is the perfect fit for Kentucky at this moment in time, I don't think it would have worked at Texas A&M. By the way, that's not an insult to Mark Stoops. Like I had Kentucky fans like, well, I mean, Mike Elko is not a better hire than Mark Stoops. Yeah, he is. He doesn't have the 10-year track record of Mark Stoops. He hasn't been a head coach in the SEC like Mark Stoops, but Mike Elko is absolutely a better hire. From the Mark Stoops perspective, the reasons why are obvious. First off, the fans weren't going to support it, and I think that is an important thing. And I'm not saying you always have to listen to fans, but I do think when a head coach isn't supported universally, if people don't like the hire, it's really hard if people don't like the hire to gain back the trust of a fan base, right? I can go back to like Charlie Strong was the first time I remember this. It was clear Texas fans didn't want him. If you remember that year, they thought they were getting Nick Saban. Um, they, 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 you know, that was like John Gruden. People were like, oh, maybe John Gruden will come back from the booth to coach Texas. So they thought they were getting Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, John Gruden. They got Charlie Strong and then they never supported him. And you could tell that it was weird from the beginning. It would have been that way for Mark Stoops. The players didn't want him. We just talked about the importance of retaining that roster. I'm here to tell you, go back and look at some of the tweets from some of the players on Saturday night. The players were mocking the hire. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying that it doesn't speak to maybe, you know, maybe there needs to, I don't know. I don't even know what to say on that. But the players weren't going to buy into it. A lot of the players were going to leave. Elko is going to do a much better job retaining that roster than Mark Stoops would have. And again, I know retaining players shouldn't be the only thing, but I do think it matters in this case when you're Texas A&M and have a national championship caliber roster in your building. Mark Stoops doesn't know Texas. And finally, like it is just a different job with different pressures. And I think Mark Stoops has been great. I think what he's done at Kentucky is unbelievable. I think he's got a very nice setup there where he makes $9 million. He's comfortable in the recruiting base. We know he's from Ohio. He recruits the crap out of Ohio and Michigan and the state of Kentucky. Know know about all the talent from the state of Kentucky that's either on the roster coming in, Dane Key, on and on and on. Um, But I also think like that job is right for him. And let's be honest, and Kentucky fans, you'll get mad at me, but you know that I'm right on this. You know that I'm right. Is that when there's an ounce of criticism or an ounce of controversy, Mark Stoops makes excuses, he places blame on others, et cetera. You don't have to look any further than all the NIL stuff earlier this year when they lost to Georgia. It would have been easy to say that's a great team. We're doing our best to one day match that talent. Instead, what does he say? You want better players? Donate to NIL. Thought it was tacky. Thought it was lame. Thought there was a lot of good ways that you could handle that situation. Didn't think that was it. So now you're going to go to Texas A&M where every single game is a pressure cooker where Jimbo Fisher goes 8-4, and 9-3 and three every single year. Not every single year. They went 5-7 and seven last year. They were trending towards 7-5 and five this year. But where Jimbo Fisher, multiple nine-win seasons, uh, a number five ranking in 2020, you're going to go there. There's going to be pressure from day one. I just don't know if he was built for that. And so I, I do think it worked out for everybody for the best. He's going back to Kentucky. I do think, and by the way, Kentucky fans, either in the YouTube comments or you can email me at Aaron Torres podcast questions at gmail.com. Tell me if I'm crazy, but I do think that now there's like a new level of appreciation, right? 
I don't want to, I don't want to do the sports radio sports podcast cliche of like, well, you know, when you and your wife almost break up, it makes it, I, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to say is I, I do think Kentucky fans, there was a two, three hour window where it was like, we're going to lose this guy, man. We appreciate everything that he's done. The wins over Florida, the, the 10 win seasons, the recruiting uptick, everything, you know, eight straight bowl games. I think nine now this year, now that he's staying, I think you appreciate it a little bit more. And I think Mark Stoops, appreciates how much that he is appreciated a little bit as well. And lastly, I'll say, I do wonder if this kind of closes the door on Mark Stoops ever leaving Kentucky. Like I said, I thought this was the off season to do it. Not saying it'll never happen, but I thought this was the off season to do it. I think he's built for the long haul. I think he's going to continue to have success at Kentucky. Congrats to him. Um, you know, he's at the place, uh, you know, he, he's at a place that I, for the most part, he's beloved in Kentucky still has a great coach. And they don't have to go through a, a new coaching search and they don't have to rebuild from the ground up. So we'll see what happens. But I do think this ended up for the best. Mike Elko, the head coach at Texas A&M. And of course, Mark Stoops back at Kentucky. So what we're going to take a quick break. Come back when we come back. Oh, we got to talk Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan, Ohio State. A lot to discuss. All right, everybody. I'm right, back. Going to be back. Going to be back. I do want to switch gears. And as crazy as it sounds, you know what I want to actually do? Get to some stuff that happened on the field. Obviously, it takes a lot to get uh, Michigan and Ohio State bumped to the second segment of the show. So shout out to Texas A&M, its fans, etc. But I do want to go ahead, dive into Michigan, Ohio State. Uh, if you follow the YouTube channel, by the way, I did do an immediate reaction on YouTube on, uh, I guess it was Saturday afternoon, immediately after the game. And I basically just spent like, eight, nine, 10 minutes yelling and screaming, Ryan day soft, can't get the job done, born on third, whatever I said, I don't even remember. I was caught up in kind of the emotions of the game. Well, now um, I have had 24 hours to think about it, to, to take a deep breath, to think about the positives, the negatives, who's to blame, et cetera. And so I want to go ahead and dive into this game. If you watch that reaction, this is some new, more updated content. We'll talk a little bit about the Michigan side, but I do want to go ahead and dive in. As for the third straight year, Michigan beats Ohio State. This game, 30 to 24, is the final score. And as I think about this game, okay, listen, we could spend, well, in the first quarter this happened, and in the third quarter that happened. Ultimately, a couple things stand out immediately about this game. Two things specifically I want to start with. One, you know when I knew Ohio State was in trouble in this game? It wasn't in the fourth quarter. It wasn't when Kyle McCord threw an interception. It wasn't this, it wasn't that. It was on literally the first drive of the game, because if you watch this game and you knew the narratives coming in, what were the narratives from Ohio state for the last two years? All we've heard is Ohio state's different. They're so much tougher. They're fearless. They're unafraid. Their defense is fixed. Ryan days yelling at Lou Holtz because Lou Holtz has the audacity to say that he's soft and his team is soft. Well, what ends up happening in the biggest game of the year with the season on the line against your biggest rival, who you have not beat first possession of the game. What does Ryan day do? gets his team into Michigan territory, gets a fourth and short, has a chance to prove to the world that everything that he said over the last year is true, that this team is different, this team is tough, this team is fearless. What ends up happening? He ends up punting the ball. That was when I knew right there. I said, maybe Ohio State wins, but if they do, it ain't going to be because Ryan Day is unafraid and he has had this come to you know what moment where he looks himself in the mirror and he's pounding himself on the chest because he's some fearless guy all of a sudden. So that was the first big takeaway. But the second big takeaway, and again, this is something we did talk a little bit about on the uh, Saturday reaction. You know how this game was decided? Again, I could go to the third quarter here and the first quarter there, and what about this and what about that? It was ultimately decided the way that the last two games were decided. In the fourth quarter, in the big moments, in the big rivalry game, with the Big Ten East on the line, with a potential college football playoff on the line, what ends up happening? One team controls the line of scrimmage. One team beats the other up. One team makes all the big plays. That team is Michigan. The other team doesn't. And so to me, you know, we could talk about all these different variables. Well, Jim Harbaugh's not there. And what about this? And Kyle McCord, the, the, the quarterback at Ohio State. You know why, why Michigan won that game? It was because... Up 27-24, Ohio State scores. Ohio State has the momentum. Michigan gets the ball back with about eight minutes left. And Michigan, for the third year in a row, you know what they did? They took the ball and they ran the ball right at Ohio State. 
They said, you want this ball back? You've got to come get it, but you got to beat us up to get it. They run a 13-play drive. Biggest moment of the year. The run game hasn't even been that good this year. That's the crazy part. J.J. McCarthy has not been good the last two weeks. Biggest moment of the year of the season. Michigan runs a 13-play drive. They have nine carries on that drive. They pick up two first downs. J.J. McCarthy makes the throw of the game, which was kind of crazy, and it easily maybe could have been picked off, but he throws across his body. I think it was Cornelius Johnson who caught it one yard short. They get the first down. And in those big moments, they didn't get the touchdown, but they took seven minutes off. They get the ball back with eight minutes to go, run 13 plays, nine runs. Ohio State's forced to use its timeouts, and Ohio State gets the ball back with one minute to go. Ohio State in those big moments can't get stops. Ohio State in the big moments, they do eventually force a field goal, but is after multiple Michigan first downs, after they've used all the timeouts, when it mattered most, Michigan could move the ball on Ohio State, and Ohio State essentially couldn't stop them. Beyond that, see what happened when Ohio State got the ball? Everybody wants to talk about the Kyle McCord interception to end the game. Just think about the final drive. Think about the fact that Ryan Day is supposed to be an offensive genius, paid $9 million a year for that moment, okay? First play of that series. Throw the ball to Travion Henderson. He gets killed out of the backfield. Michigan Reddit gets killed out of the backfield. And the best it was the best thing that happened to them that he didn't catch it because the clock would have kept running. So that play happened. You know what happens from there? Gus Johnson starts yelling and screaming, throw the ball to Marvin Harrison. They throw the ball to Marvin Harrison. First down, surprise, surprise. Next play, throw the ball to Julian Fleming. He fumbles it. He fumbles it, and it happens to be recovered by a Mecca Buka wide receiver. And then the final play of the game, Kyle McCord throws an interception. And so just think about the two teams in the final eight minutes of the game. One, Michigan, 13-play drive, nine runs, two first downs, makes Ohio State use their timeouts. Ohio State gets the ball back. gets a uh, you know McCord gets his running back blown up. They finally throw the ball to the best player on the field. Then a fumble, recovered thankfully, and then an interception. One team was prepared for the moment. One team was fearless. One team wasn't. By the way, I hate to brag because I get a lot of stuff wrong, but this is what I told you was going to happen. My pick was Michigan to win and Michigan to cover because I said in the big moments, Michigan takes after their head coach, even if the head coach isn't on the sidelines. They're, they're, they're fearless. They're unafraid. They're not scared. They make big plays. As I just said a minute ago, Ohio State cowers up into a ball. That's exactly what we saw on Saturday. And so when we get into this game, what I want to do now is talk about both perspectives. And I know some shows, oh, you always got to talk about the winner first. No, no, no. What am I going to talk about with Michigan? There's a lot to talk about, and we'll get to it in a minute. But the story here is Ohio State. Because for the third straight year, Ohio State loses to Michigan. And for the first time, There are no excuses because I go back to, first of all, two years ago, it was, well, it was snowing. And, you know, there was a report that the whole team had the flu. Then last year, Michigan ends up winning again in Columbus. But then this year, let me say this. Listen, I have gone so many different directions on the Connor Stallion stuff, right? I first, I thought Michigan needs to be punished, but I assumed that there was going to be due process. Then there's not due process. Then I thought the Big Ten punishment was unfair, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I bring it up to very simply say that I do believe in my heart of hearts, I I truly believe this, and Ohio State fans comment in the comment section, tell me if I'm wrong, whatever. I believe in my heart of hearts that most Ohio State fans basically brushed aside the last two years and basically said, well, you know, we didn't really lose because Ryan Day soft or because our team is soft or because we weren't the better team. We just lost because Michigan was cheating and Michigan was sign stealing. Well, fast forward to 2023. There's no Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines. You're going up against an interim head coach. No Connor Stallions. No sign stealing. How about this, by the way? Michigan's best cornerback, Will Johnson, gets hurt in the, I believe, the third quarter. Doesn't play most of the second half. Michigan's best offensive lineman, Zach Zinter, gets hurt. Doesn't play late in the game. And Michigan still wins, so stop making excuses, Ohio State fans. This is on your players and, more specifically, your coaching staff. So let's dive into the blame pie of Ohio State. One, I'll start by saying this. I have heard a lot of 
besmirchment, I don't know what the right word is, of criticism for Ohio State quarterback Kyle McCord. I feel like he is taking a disproportional amount of blame for this loss. And I'm not saying that he's C.J. Stroud. I'm not saying that he's Justin Fields. But at the same time, here's the crazy part, Ohio State fans, whether you want to admit it or not, here's the truth. A year ago, you didn't think C.J. Stroud was Justin Fields either. And then what ended up happening? C.J. Stroud left Ohio State. He's playing the best football of his career outside of Columbus. So I don't think Kyle McCord is perfect. I do think he is limited. I don't think he's the reason that you lost the game. Stop blaming him. If he's not, listen, if he's not good enough, he's not good enough, okay? If the if there's a better quarterback, go find him in the portal. If Devin Brown, the backup, is better, then get him some reps. But Kyle McCord isn't the reason that you lost. You know the reason that you lost? It's for two people and two people only, and I think only one of them is getting blamed. One is Ryan Day. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But two, let me ask you a question. Why is no one blaming Ohio State a defensive coordinator, Jim Jim Knowles? And by the way, I apologize. I know I'm going long here, but this was a huge game with huge consequences. And I can't stop yelling and screaming about it. Why am I only seeing blame to Kyle McCord and Ryan Day? I listened to a two-hour Ohio State postgame show while I was working out Sunday morning while I was walking the dog. I didn't hear Jim Knowles' name mentioned once. For people who don't know who Jim Knowles is, Jim Knowles is Ohio State's defensive coordinator. He gets paid $2 million a year. He was brought in two years ago after the first loss to Michigan. And the first year, he definitely fixed that defense. And then it came time to play Michigan. And what ended up happening? He got beat up in the fourth quarter. Donovan Edwards and Blake Corm ran all over him. Well, not Blake Corm. He was hurt, I guess. Donovan Edwards ran all over him. This year, it's supposed to be different. Top three defense in the country. I think they're number one or number two in scoring defense, number one and number two in total defense. You know how many times Michigan punted in the fourth in the second half? You know how many times Michigan punted in the second half? Michigan punted zero times in the second half. And so some of this is on Ryan Day, but some of it's on the $2 million a year defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles. I say it with Ryan Day all the time. Ryan Day is not defined by what he does against Indiana, Michigan State, Rutgers, whoever. He's defined by winning against Michigan, competing for Big Ten championships, and winning national championships. Well, Jim Knowles, Jim Knowles, you're not paid $2 million a year to look good against Rutgers or Indiana or Michigan State or Minnesota. Your job is to have your team ready for the biggest moments, and they were not. They got punked at the line of scrimmage in the fourth quarter of the biggest game of the year, and I haven't heard anybody talk about it, and I don't understand why. Secondly, this falls on Ryan Day, man. And listen, I'll tell you this. I have said for years, I think he's a little soft. I'm sure he's a nice guy, and this isn't a criticism of him as a husband or a father or a person. Maybe he cares about the players. Maybe the players love him. I don't know. But at the same time, in big moments, he's soft. I still go back, by the way. You can make fun of me if you want. The Lou Holtz stuff, to me, still speaks to everything you need to know about Ryan Day. Biggest, most emotional win of the season to that point. One of the biggest wins of his career at Notre Dame. What does he do? He grabs the mic and starts talking about Lou Holtz, an 86-year-old former head coach of Notre Dame. Who cares? And you know what? Here's the bottom line. The great coaches, what do they do? They block out the noise. You think if you came to Urban Meyer on a game day on Saturday, when you're at Notre Dame in a top 10 matchup, and you came to Urban Meyer and said, hey, Urban, hey, coach, did you see what Lou Holtz said about you? What do you think Urban Meyer would say to that? He would say, get the F out of my face. Why the F do you think I care? Excuse my, my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blocking out words here. Get the F out of my face. Why the F do you think I would effing care what effing Lou Holtz has to say about me? Same with Nick Saban. Nick Saban might literally choke you. He might say, get out of my face. Why are you talking to me about this? Ryan Day is concerned with what Lou Holtz said. That's soft to me. He's listening to the outside noise. He cares what people say. And so that is who he is. And I'll say it again. There are no more excuses. I think Ohio State fans, for the most part, spent the last couple of weeks trying to justify and trying to explain and trying to blame away the last two losses on Connor Stallions and Sign Stallions. Well, there's no Connor Stallions. There's no Jim Harbaugh. There's no, no nothing. You lost in the biggest game of the year for the third year in a row to an interim head coach, and you have no one to blame but Ryan Day. And so when I look at the Ryan Day situation, I'm curious what's next for him, man, because listen, I, we, we love in college football to talk about the hot seed and the this and the that. 
there's no hot seat for Ryan Day. He's not going anywhere, and I'm not implying that he is. By the way, some people were calling for it. On uh, the Saturday recap, I read some tweets from Maurice Claret. Maurice Claret was like, Ohio State legend, like, you got to go, man. But Maurice Claret said what I said. When you're Ryan Day, you're not paid nine million a year to beat Michigan and or to beat Michigan State and Indiana and Minnesota. You're paid to beat Michigan, win the Big Ten, go to the college football playoff. You're not doing it. And so when I look at Ryan Day's future, I, I do wonder what's next for him, right? Because listen, there no one's gonna he's not getting fired. Nothing's gonna happen to him. But at the end of the day, I you know I've heard others say this. Uh, you know I'll give credit Gary Parrish, college basketball reporter. He says this all the time. He said there's a difference between you know, job pressure and quality of life pressure. Ryan Day doesn't have job pressure. He ain't getting fired if he loses a bowl game or if he loses to Michigan next year. There is a quality of life pressure, though, and that guy for the next 365 days a year, it ain't getting any better. And I don't know what reason there is to think if you're an Ohio State fan that it is. Because, look, talent is not the issue. Think about all the talent that he has had for the last few years. Marvin Harrison, C.J. Stroud, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Paris Johnson was a top 10 pick, J.T. Tuimolala. You on and on down the list. Uh, Travion Henderson, Emeka Abuka is going to be a first-round pick. Like Talent is not the issue. It's not the issue. The issue is up here, and the issue is having your team prepared to win the biggest games that matter the most. And so don't tell me about his record overall. And don't tell me about, well, you know, they, they he's 56. Nobody cares. When you are the head coach at Ohio State, it is one of the most pressure-filled jobs in America, but it comes with a lot of perks too. And your job is to beat Michigan, compete for Big Ten championships. So we'll see what happens for Ryan Day from here. If I'm him, I'm probably at least kicking the tires on the NFL, see what's out there. If you know, Everyone's talking about Jim Harbaugh to the Chicago Bears. If I can get Caleb Williams and another top five pick, maybe bring Marvin Harrison with me, all of a sudden that job looks intriguing to me. We'll see what happens, but... Just wanted to to talk a little bit about the Ohio State perspective. From the Michigan perspective, listen, we just talked about all the stats, all the this, all the that, how they won the game. Very briefly, let me just give credit where it's due, man. What Michigan did on Saturday, but more importantly, what Michigan did over the course of this entire season, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. And I said it from the beginning. Michigan was my preseason pick to win the national championship because they have dealt with so much adversity over the last couple of years most notably Jim Harbaugh interviewing for multiple head coaching jobs through the years. And so I bring it up because think about everything that that group at Michigan has had to overcome just this year. You understand they're 12 and 0 right now. You understand that six of their games, the head coach wasn't there. Ohio state can't beat Michigan with Ryan day. Michigan went six and 0 without Jim Harbaugh. And in two of the biggest games of the year, three of the biggest games, really, if you include Maryland. Beyond that, think about everything. Think about the fact that they flew to Penn State not knowing if Jim Harbaugh was going to be their coach. They woke up against Penn State not knowing if they were if he was going to be the coach because there was the injunction process. Then you spent all week preparing for Maryland not knowing if Jim Harbaugh is going to be the coach before finally on Thursday you find out that, in fact, that he is. So I give this group of guys so much credit. Nothing has phased them. They had nothing to do with the alleged sign stealing. They had nothing to do with the Big Ten suspension. They had nothing to do with what their coaching staff did. But stuff just rolls off their shoulders, and they just get ready for the next one. Beyond that, really quickly, you know who really deserves credit? Sharon Moore, man. First of all, what he was thrown into against Penn State, we talked about it then. Day of the game, doesn't know if he's the head coach or just the play caller. Comes out, gets the win. Maryland was a struggle. And against Michigan's biggest rival in the biggest moment. He not only got the win, he was the more fearless, aggressive coach. While calling plays, while having to be a head coach, it was unbelievable. That guy deserves so much credit. I'd say he deserves a head coaching job, but I think he's probably going to end up replacing Jim Harbaugh whenever Jim Harbaugh leaves. And finally, let me say this about Jim Harbaugh. Um, I think Jim Harbaugh, in my opinion, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know. If his desire, all the reports are that his desire is to be an NFL head coach, to win a Super Bowl, to do what his his brother accomplished, uh, to to get that ultimate prize. If I was Jim Harbaugh, I'd have a really hard time leaving Michigan right now. Now, admittedly, we don't know what's coming from the NCAA. We don't know if a suspension is coming. We don't know if scholarship productions are coming. But if if I was Jim Harbaugh, you spent, this is now year what, year nine, year eight, whatever, 
It took this long to take control of the rivalry. You own the rivalry and beyond owning the rivalry. I think you're in Ryan Day's head. I think Ryan Day is scared to death of Jim Harbaugh and Michigan and the consequences that come with losing that game. Again, I just talked about it a minute ago. That's why I picked Michigan. Because I knew Ryan Day would coach tight because I knew that everybody expected him to win. And I knew in the back of his head what would be going through his mind if they ended up losing that game. And so I just bring it up to say, if I'm Jim Harbaugh, I don't like, I'm not scared of Ohio State anymore. They're a great program. They're always going to have great players, but you own Ryan Day. So if I'm Jim Harbaugh, why am I leaving for the NFL? It took all this time to get complete control of this conference. And I'll take it a step further. You know what I truly believe? And I tweeted this out and some people will disagree with me. I truly believe in my heart of hearts in the expanded new Big Ten. I don't think Ohio State's the biggest threat anymore to you. I actually think it's Oregon and Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning's a dog. And the one thing you could say about Dan Lanning, he ain't afraid of nothing. He went for it on fourth down against Washington, didn't apologize for it after the game, wasn't afraid, didn't spend weeks sulking in the corner, had his team come out, play their best football after that game. He's fearless. He's recruiting his butt off. The collective, you know, is set up good. I just bring it up to say, I, I think Dan Lanning is more of a threat to Jim Harbaugh in Michigan over the next five, six years than Ohio State is. Not saying Ohio State won't have good teams. Not saying in a 12-team playoff era that Ohio State isn't going to get in probably every single year. But in terms of teams that are going to look you in the eye and not back down, it's probably more Oregon than it is Ohio State. I think Ohio State is shook beyond belief. I think the entire core of that organization and of that program is shook beyond belief. So Jim Harbaugh, enjoy the victory. I know, listen, unfortunately, I saw Jim Harbaugh was in the hospital with Zach Zinter after the game. But credit to Michigan, third straight win. Enjoy every minute of it. Go take care of Iowa in the Big Ten championship game, uh, and we'll see. Obviously, uh, you know, there, there's a playoff monkey. You got to get off your back. We'll see if you can do that. We'll see who you're playing. We still don't have that decided, so there's still a lot left. Oh, that was a long segment. That, that had to be like a, you know, I don't have a timer on when I'm doing this stuff. That had to be like a 40 minute segment. We're gonna take a quick break. Come back. We'll react to the rest of the weekend in college football, the Iron Bowl thriller there. Um, then we will talk about, uh, some of the other stuff with playoff ramifications, Florida state, et cetera. Quick break. Be right back. All right, everybody. I right, back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Final segment of the show. So good to be back. Do want to go ahead and wrap a little bit of college football. Now, listen, I'll say this. If you're a college hoop said, and you're sitting there wondering Torres, how are you not talking about feast week? Well, I'm here to tell you, listen. First off, go back and listen to Wednesday's show. It was the episode before the holiday. I talked a lot of college hoops. Make sure to go back and download that show. Also, as I mentioned a minute ago, I will be traveling this week to not one, but two college hoops games. I will go to Duke at Arkansas on Wednesday, first trip to Bud Walton Arena ever. And then on Friday, UConn at Kansas, first trip to Fog Allen. I am so excited, so thrilled. If you have any pointers, Fayetteville, Lawrence, whatever, Please hit me up. So excited for that. Plenty of college hoops on today's show. We'll do some reactions, maybe live from the arena if the opportunity presents itself. And then also, uh, we'll be talking plenty of college football because we have these five championship games this weekend that are going to be awesome. But let's stick with this past weekend, and let's start with what can only be described one of the craziest Iron Bowls ever, okay? Alabama at Auburn. Alabama is a 13.5-point favorite, and the one thing that I've learned through the years doesn't matter how good, how bad Auburn is. They never get embarrassed at home. We actually talked about this on Wednesday's show. Last three times, Auburn has hosted Alabama. Alabama, or Auburn had one, two, two out of three. And the third one was double overtime, and Auburn almost won that game. That was the year of Brian Harson's first year. They're kind of falling apart as a program, but they still managed to play Alabama tough at home. And so I expected a close competitive game. And that's exactly what we got. One of those weird games where you felt like, okay, Auburn, it's going to be weird things happen at Jordan Hare. You know, daylight turns to night. Stuff starts breaking their way. They're in position to win. Are they actually going to do it? But you also never really felt like Alabama was going to win either, lose either. And so it's set up what I can only describe as one of the wildest finishes that I have ever seen in college football history, okay? Auburn leads 24 to 20. They force a punt with Alabama. And I'll try to be brief here, but it is so insane. Force a punt. 
The poor Auburn return man muffs the punt recovered by Alabama right around their own 20 yard line. Okay. So they are in, you know, field goal range already, but they, they clearly need a touchdown. Can't get it going. First down. Can't get it going. Second down. Third down there at third and 20. Okay. Sets up a third and 20 Jalen Milrow, their quarterback with the incredible speed rips off a 19 yard run trucks, a dude ends up being one yard short. They convert the fourth down to keep the chains moving and keep their season alive. Then it got even crazier somehow. They completely, they, they, they third and nine, third and 20, they, they get 19 yards, convert the fourth down. Next, next set of downs ball goes over Jalen Milrose head ends up setting up what a, a, a third. And uh, let me make sure, I, I guess it would have been a third and 26 Jalen Milrow takes off. Jalen Milrow goes to run. Then he decides to pass. And wait a second now. You can't do that. He was past the line of scrimmage. So they lose it down. I guess it was technically second down. So it sets up fourth and 31. One play left for the entire season. If you lose this game, you're playing for nothing but pride in an SEC championship in Atlanta. You can't go to the college football playoff. What happens? Jalen Milrow drops back. Jalen Milrow throws. Isaiah Bond back in the end zone. Touchdown. They practice it every day. And Alabama gets the conversion and wins 27-24. And what can only be described as one of the craziest Iron Bowls that's ever been played, okay? From the Alabama perspective, listen, Nick Saban said it. You know, we've had a lot of bad experiences in this stadium. I'm glad for one of a, for one of them to work out in our favor. I think it was the exact 10-year anniversary of the kick six. Chris Davis returning that, that deep ball for a touchdown. So it's crazy all the stuff that has happened in that stadium. Alabama, as I said, they survived. They now go to Atlanta, play Georgia in the SEC championship game, and the winner of that is in obviously great, great, great position to make the college football playoff. If Alabama had lost that, it's hard to see the scenario where they make the playoff, even if they beat Georgia, so they're playing for that. From the Auburn perspective, all I can say, I know it's not what Auburn fans want to hear, and I know nobody really believes in like moral victories, I think you got to feel like it's a net positive year one under Hugh Freeze. Remember, they have to this point played Georgia tougher than anybody that Georgia's played all year. Lost by seven. That's the closest game Georgia's played all year. Georgia destroyed Ole Miss. Georgia destroyed Kentucky. Georgia destroyed uh, Tennessee a few days, a few weeks ago, last week. So Auburn played Georgia tougher than anybody. They played Alabama down to the final minute when they had the lead. If Coy Moore holds onto that ball, they potentially win it. And the recruiting is through the roof. And like, that's the thing that I, I I look at. You you play Georgia tough, you nearly beat Bama, and this is the least talented roster that Hugh Freeze will ever have. They're trending towards a top 10 recruiting class. They're probably going to flip a five-star Cam Coleman wide receiver here in the next couple of weeks. I don't know that for a fact, but everything is trending that way. Currently committed to AM. We'll see if they can get him in the fold. And I think it's all like, like this is the worst roster he's ever going to have. The schedule, in theory, gets a little bit easier when we remove divisions next year. They'll still play Georgia and Alabama for the foreseeable future. But I just bring it up because I don't know how you can't look at this as a net positive under Hugh Freeze. Again, I know that's not how you feel on a day like today after that devastating loss, but I think there are some positives to take out of it. Really quickly, you know, I just want to give like a half a second, rather than going through all the other games, I think the games that I would talk about Florida state surviving Florida, Oregon, destroying Oregon state. Let's just talk about the conference championship games because those are set. We have Washington against Oregon in the PAC 12 championship. We have Texas versus Oklahoma state in the big 12. We have Florida state versus Louisville in the ACC. We have Alabama versus uh, Georgia in the sec. And we have Michigan versus Iowa in the big 10. And so what's been so interesting about this year, right? Every single week, we keep waiting for some of these teams to lose, for the playoff picture to start to thin itself out, and it just hasn't happened. Washington won on a last-second field goal uh, on Saturday. They're now playing uh, Oregon without a single loss on their schedule. Alabama survived. Texas, for the most part, has survived week after week after week, although they took care of business against Texas Tech on Saturday, and or Friday, excuse me. And so it sets up a very interesting scenario where there's a possibility, and we've talked about this, that we could have five undefeated or one loss champions in college football. The SEC is going to produce either a one loss or undefeated champion 
in either Georgia or Alabama. The Big Ten, Michigan could be undefeated coming out of that game. Washington or Oregon, one of those teams will come out with zero or one losses. Texas can survive if they beat Oklahoma State, one loss. And of course, finally, uh, Michigan, I said, Florida State is the other one that if they win, they'll be an undefeated power conference champion. And so I think the big question everybody wants to know, what happens if Georgia wins or even Alabama? What happens if Texas wins? What happens if Florida State wins? What happens if Michigan wins? What happens in the Pac-12? And what happens if we end up with a one or undefeated champion in one loss or undefeated champion in every league? What I'm here to tell you, as I see it, I think the committee is praying, praying, for one of three scenarios to happen. One, I think they want Florida State to lose. I mean, listen, nobody roots against anybody, but Florida State, it was tough to watch them against Florida on Saturday and truly believe that they are one of the four best teams in college football. But at the same time, I think it's also hard to believe that if they are an undefeated ACC champion, that they will get left out. So the committee, I believe, wants Florida State to lose, make their lives easier. I think it would also help if Texas lost. If Florida State wins and Texas loses, that eliminates the Big 12 champion, Oklahoma State, from the playoff picture. Then you take the SEC champ, the Big 10 champ, the ACC champ, and the Pac-12 champ. I guess there's a scenario, by the way, where if Michigan doesn't win the the Big 10 championship, then maybe the Big 10 doesn't have a representative. I think that's actually probably in play. And then lastly, let me say this. I think there's also another scenario which makes the committee's job relatively easy. If Georgia wins, if Washington wins, if Michigan wins, and if Florida State all win, they're all undefeated going into next weekend. There would be four undefeated conference champions. And at that point, you could kind of just say, Texas, respectfully, we love you, but you got to get up out of here. We got four conference champions that are undefeated. So we'll see what happens. It's not going to work out easily. It never does. Um, And if all those teams win, I'm not going to get into every scenario right now. I don't know exactly what they're going to do. I I don't know what they're going to do if they end up with those five undefeated or one loss champs. I think it depends on different scenarios. Florida State's the wild card. Like I said, I don't think you can sit there and watch them and say that they are one of the four best teams in college football, but we've never seen an undefeated power conference champion ever be left out of the playoff. So we'll see what happens. We'll keep you updated on that as the week goes on. And then finally, one last note, you know, congrats to... James Madison and congrats to Jacksonville state. Remember we had Rich Rodriguez on this show a few weeks ago, those two teams not eligible for bowl games because of the transition period. They're new to FBS football, but because there were not enough teams that are bowl eligible, it means that Jacksonville state and James Madison in their first or second years in FBS football will go to bowl games. There's a great video of my buddy, Rich Rodriguez basically telling his players, guys, I think they lost yesterday. They lost on Saturday. He basically said, guys, wasn't happy with that performance, but guess what? You're going bowling. Anyway, congrats to uh, Jacksonville State and James Madison. All right, I think it's time for me to get out of here. Man, what a show. If you're not subscribed to the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast, please make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure that you are subscribed. Also, make sure to rate and review the show. Go ahead, give us a quick five stars. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, all that good stuff. Make sure you're following on social media at Aaron underscore Torres on Twitter, at Aaron Torres Pod on Instagram, Aaron Torres Podcast Questions at gmail.com, Aaron Torres Podcast Questions at gmail.com. We will have a Wednesday show. I may record during the day on Wednesday. I may record earlier on Wednesday. I'll keep you updated as I learn more. But again, traveling this week, excited. If you have any uh, tips for Fayetteville, if you have any tips for Lawrence, please let me know. And I think that's it for today's show. Shout out to Tor Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you f head. Unblock me, bro. I'll be back on Wednesday. New episode, Aaron Torres Pod. Hope everybody had a great holiday week.